Now we're pleased to welcome on stage Kareem, who's one of the co-founders of Athenet. So can we get a big hand? Welcome. Kareem. Excited to be here. Um, my name is Karim El Malki. I'm one of the founders of uh, Athernet, and uh, Athernet's been around for a long time now—18 uh, years. It's been a long journey. I would have hoped it was a little bit shorter, but you know, that's life. Um, and uh, Athernet started uh, working on private 3G, actually. Uh, private 3G. Yeah, okay. so way back, right? When uh, it wasn't called Private 3G, it was these crazy Italians doing something they don't <laughs> understand. And uh, we were these uh, you know, outcasts from the telco world because we were doing something which was weird. Enterprises using cellular technology, right? Not going to happen. Then we did 4G and, uh, and suddenly things started taking off and 5G and now we're here. So super incredibly happy uh, to, to be here. Um, we were talking about you know, 5G and Wi-Fi, so you know, this is mecca of Wi-Fi. I, I couldn't be happier right, to be here because I see a lot of interactions happening. We've been working on adapting cellular technology to the enterprise. So what we started doing from the very beginning was first on 3G, then 4G, and now 5G, understanding how we could apply a technology that no one was using at the time in an enterprise because we saw the future of cellular actually being with enterprises. We started with mines. Uh, we started actually with public safety were the earliest. Uh, we did some of the earliest public safety projects starting from 2010 on 4G. Um, one of the biggest you know, sort of earthquakes that happened in Europe you know, happened in Italy and our technology was used to uh, provide connectivity both to the emergency workers and to the people that had been displaced. We have been doing mines. We have thousands of networks around the world. We're doing mines in Asia, countries like Indonesia, Australia, uh, um, Europe. We have you know, Sweden. We have the deepest mine in the Americas. We have South America, where customers have specific needs. And we saw this market change happening. There are specific needs, uh, critical connectivity. Uh, we, they need to connect the people wherever they are on a very wide area. And we could see that as a, a gap, clearly. Um, a, a gap that had not been addressed. So that critical connectivity that your customers need, what are the products you have to solve that problem? So we deploy, we have these networks, for example, we've got networks uh, running in, uh, in Italy connecting um, hundreds of thousands of devices, IoT, so massive IoT, uh, all the, the car charging stations in Italy um, from a company called uh, NLX, and NL has been a key investor of, our, of ours, um, are, are connected using our core network technology. We have 31 million smart meters that are connected using that technology. So we're talking critical because if that network goes down, you can't drive your electric vehicle away. So we get caught. <laughs> I, I get a lot of problems. Um, and we have, other situa we have a lot of other uh, critical um, networks. Uh, airport in Paris. Uh, you have a lot of operations happening in the airport like baggage reconciliation, right? You must have been on a plane where they needed to take a bag off very rapidly. Uh, and they need to go in and identify it and take it out. The problem is you don't have great network connectivity when you're out somewhere uh, in a parking space. And therefore, private, a private 4G connectivity throughout a very wide area can give you that reliable connectivity, that low latency for someone to actually do that job very quickly, reduce the cost, because every minute a plane stays on the ground when it shouldn't be, it's, it's a cost, and, uh, and move very rapidly. So if it's so great, is it a Wi-Fi killer? Oh, that's a good question. I don't throw anything at <laughs> Not me. to be dramatic I, or anything. <laughs> be careful uh, about the answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I knew they told me. Um, <laughs> Remember who's going to be paying for that. <laughs> the salary about a month from now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, uh, it, it's, um, we've been strong believers in, uh, and I don't, I, I'm being honest here, right? It, it, it's not prepared. Um, we've been uh, uh, strong believers in the, um, Whole, uh, in the interworking between Wi-Fi and cellular. In fact, 
we never believed that, uh, unlike others in this industry, that 4G or even 5G would ever kill Wi-Fi. We see those as complementary. In fact, there's very few cases where they overlap because it would be very difficult to do what we do in mines with Wi-Fi and airports with Wi-Fi. However, those same customers are great Wi-Fi users, right? Uh, we're talking about schools, we're talking about ports. We have some of the biggest ports also uh, here in the US. Some things need Wi-Fi, but some others need a separate connectivity. C consider it as a separate layer. You have additional frequencies with a completely separate layer uh, that can give you this reliable connectivity for certain types of applications like, you know, we talked about, uh, um, you know, IoT uh, and, and critical low latency networking. So the interaction between those two is fundamental and how these two will integrate will be, I think, the future and, and what we'll be talking a lot in the coming years. So uh, I know we can't talk about the future of Athena and Aruba together yet, but um, what do you see customers moving toward? As you, as you look at the market or the trends, what do you think customers want in the future? We started from a situation where uh, this technology was used only by mobile operators and I think mobile art operators have slowly started to understand that this technology is also, is also for enterprises. Um, 5G is not a consumer technology. I know um, this is... <laughs> I'm, I'm fortunately in Wi-Fi world, if I were a telco I'd get stuff thrown at me, but it's not consumer, it's for businesses. And it's for critical connectivity for businesses. So it, we have to look at the needs of enterprises, and I think in the audience you probably know a lot more, and I'm looking forward to talk to you know, a lot of you to know more about what these enterprises need. But it's not the complexity that's been a part of the telco industry so far. It's simplicity, simple, quick, easy to install networks that really look like Wi-Fi. And that's what we've been doing for over 10 years, uh, really looking very carefully at what's going on in enterprise and Wi-Fi and trying to make this technology compatible. Why would someone in the audience go to us instead of going to a telco for private 5G? Well, and, and that's a, a very good question. Um, if you are used to managing your own network uh, and owning your own network, because if you get a call from your CEO, the network is down, you need to know why, you need to have full control, um, then you need to own the technology. You need to own that network. And that's what we give you with private 5G and private 4G, available today using open frequencies here in the US, CBRS, easy to set up. Anyone, I mean, I've lived in New York, I had our own network running on our own floor. Um, very easy to set up, use standard mobile phones, right, that can roam in and out of your network, eSIMs, so you, very easy to configure and, and connect in there. So that's really... Okay, great. Well, um, I'm a consumer of 5G, and I would love to know the weirdest place that you have installed or your company has installed 5G. There's a lot of weird places. I think Antarctica <laughs> with the SpaceX is one of them. That was okay. very, very interesting and a place where I was unsure things <laughs> would have worked as well as it they did. It worked in the cold? Yeah, but it did. It okay, did. great. It That's did. pretty weird. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Kareem. It's been fantastic having you here.